Since time immemorial, plants and fungi have proven to be one of Homo sapiens' greatest resources, not just as sustenance, but as a fount of healing medicine, spiritual inspiration, and mystery. Humans do not merely utilize these species for these purposes, but are intrinsically involved in the cultural knowledge surrounding them, their domestication, and safekeeping. Imagine a world without painkillers, antibiotics, anticoagulants, antimalarial medicines, or some chemotherapies, all of which have been either directly derived from, synthesized, or inspired by plants and fungi. And who would want to live in a world without the mystery and magic of poison-tipped arrows or hallucinogens? In Plants of the Gods podcast, renowned ethnobotanist Dr. Mark Plotkin, who has worked in and on the Amazon for almost four decades studying the relationship between humans and plants, takes his listeners on an inspiring journey from the most remote corners of Amazonia to other exotic locales. Learn about the fascinating history and uses of the plants of knowledge and power, like the hallucinogenic snuffs of the Yanomamo tribe, Tacoca, from which cocaine is derived, the ayahuasca liana, from which a hallucinogenic brew is produced, or the diverse formulations of curare, a plant mixture which relaxes the muscles of the body and leads to asphyxiation. Not only will you better understand what we know about these sacred species and how we use them, but how they are revolutionizing Western medicine while the fight is on to protect these healing species and the people who know them best. This and more from Plants of the Gods with Dr. Mark Plotkin. I want to focus this episode on my mentor, Richard Evan Schultes, often known as the father of ethnobotany. And any time Schultes was addressed that way, he was quick to point out that ethnobotany began with an expedition launched by an Egyptian pharaoh to the land of Punt, Somalia, in search of frankincense trees, and he wasn't quite that old. Nonetheless, he was a towering figure, in fact, the towering figure, in 20th century ethnobotany. Now, it was a warm September night in 1974 when I entered his classroom. The classroom was like an ethnographic museum. One wall was covered with huge green maps of the Amazon. From the rafters hung Amazonian Indian dance costumes with glistening black demon faces. Two long parallel display cases flanked the room, filled to overflowing with botanical booty from around the world. Black palm blowguns from Colombia, shiny silver hashish pipes from India, and tiny bows and arrows from the Congo. Presiding over the tableau was Professor Schultes himself, tall, crew-cut, and dressed in an immaculate white lab coat, white dress shirt, crimson tie, and silver wire rim glasses. As he called the class to order and began to show his slides, one picture in particular changed my life forever. A scene in which three Indians in grass skirts and bark cloth masks danced at the edge of a jungle clearing. Quote, Here you see three Indians of the Yukuna tribe doing the sacred Kayari dance under the influence of plants to keep away the forces of darkness. The one on the left has a Harvard degree. Next slide, please. From that moment on, I and many, many others were hooked on plants, ethnobotany, indigenous peoples, and the Amazon rainforest. Schultes, without question, was not only an incredible inspiration to his students, but the greatest botanical explorer of the Amazon in the 20th century. He survived plane crashes, boat sinkings, bandits, hunger, dysentery, and repeated bouts of malaria. But he always insisted he never had any adventures in the Amazon. Schultes lived and traveled with forest peoples for almost 14 years, sometimes amongst tribes that had never seen a white man before. At one point, he was gone for so long that friends in the Colombian capital of Bogota had given him up for dead. They were in the process of arranging memorial services in his honor when he reappeared at the National Herbarium, frightening more than a few of his fellow botanists. Ethnobotanist, taxonomist, writer, and photographer, Schultes is widely regarded as a great conservationist as well. In December of 41, he entered the Amazon on a mission to study how indigenous peoples use plants for medicinal, ritual, and practical purposes. He went on to spend so much time 
with these indigenous peoples that he created a relationship or relationships with them equaled by few people in the Western scientific community. His area of focus was the Northwest Amazon, an area that remained largely unknown and uninfluenced by the outside world, isolated by the Andes to the west and dense jungles and impassable rapids on all other sides. In this remote area, Schultes lived amongst little study tribes, mapped uncharted rivers, and was the first scientist to explore some areas that have not been researched since. His notes and photographs are some of the only existing documentation of indigenous cultures in a region of the Amazon on the cusp of change. And let me refer you to the Richard Schulte's storybook map on the Amazon Team website, amazonteam.org. This multifaceted, multimedia presentation of his life and adventures has to be seen to be appreciated. This was created by the Amazon Conservation Team under the leadership, in this case, of the cartographer Brian Hetler. So let me talk a little bit about what Schultes was like to the people around him. And let me start with the, the students. Uh, in the words of Dr. Paul Cox, who was an entering graduate student at Harvard 1977, he was looking for a thesis advisor, which is what graduate students do, somebody to study under, essentially a mentor. And he received some very disturbing advice. He was told by one professor there, whatever you do, stay away from Richard Evans Schultes. He spent a decade alone in the Amazon. He's a dinosaur, and he's dangerous to otherwise good students. <laughs> Wade Davis, an undergraduate at the time, said to the undergraduate students that Schultes was a hero in an age without heroes. And in the 70s or 80s, it was the first ethnobotanical congress in Latin America. It was held in Mexico. And much of the tenor of the discussion was how the Mexicans and other Latinos resented the fact that all of these gringos were coming down there and doing all these studies and that the Latinos should study their own plants and their own indigenous peoples. Uh, and I had to smile when the proceedings were published and here's the dedication. Para Richard Evan Schultes, King Abrio El Camino. For Richard Schultes, who blazed the trail. So Schultes was beloved by the undergraduate students, by the graduate students, by many, if not most, if not all of his Latin colleagues. But I think most important of all is how he was regarded by the indigenous peoples themselves. Now, I've been to Oklahoma, where Schulte studied peyote, and I've lived in Oaxaca, where Schulte studied uh, the magic mushrooms, and I have spent decades going back and forth to the Northwest Amazon, where Schulte did his most important field work of all, and where he made the scientific discovery of ayahuasca. And so, let me tell you what the indigenous peoples told me in Oklahoma, in Mexico, and in the Amazon. Schultes was the first white person we met who not only treated us with respect, but actually wanted to learn from us. By our side, he danced our sacred dances, ate our peyote, chewed our coca, and drank our ayahuasca. We loved him. Schultes began his career in 1933 as a poor kid in East Boston, got a scholarship to attend Harvard, and because he was a scholarship student. He had to do a work-study job. So at the time, he was interested in medicine. And remember, at that point in time, medicine and botany were very much intricately intertwined. So he went to look for a work-study job at the Botanical Museum, which stands today on Oxford Street, just north of Harvard Yard, uh, and looks the exact same as the day that Schulte showed up on the doorstep looking for a job. He was actually born in East Boston, and it's a particularly interesting part of his backstory. His father was German, his mother was English, and he was born and raised in East Boston. Now, East Boston at the time was essentially an Italian and Irish ghetto. So Schultes was already an outsider, and learning how to live and get along with other communities, I think, was fundamental to his development and his beginning and his training as an ethnobotanist. 
And when he was about 10, he got very sick. I, I, I don't know what, what exactly he had. <clears throat> I've talked to his son, Neil, who's a esteemed biologist in his own right. Nobody's sure what it was, but he was bedridden for months. And his father, Otto, was anxious that young Richard not lose any time while he was bedridden. So he went four blocks south of the house to the East Boston Public Library, which still stands, and pulled a book off the shelf called Notes of a Botanist on the Amazon and the Andes. And this was essentially the autobiography of Richard Spruce, who became Schulte's hero. And Schulte's read about Spruce's 14 years in the Amazon and in the Andes. Uh, he was the first scientist to encounter ayahuasca, and I can assure you that Schulte's was the only 10-year-old in East Boston reading about ayahuasca in those times. Now, at the Botanical Museum, Schultes quickly fell under, fell under the sway of the director, a Boston patrician by the name of Oakes Ames. This being the 30s, the depths of the Depression, naturalistic museums were kept afloat by wealthy men with deep pockets. Ames took a special liking to Schultes and really took him on essentially as an apprentice. Now, in... Ames' famous class, Bio 104, Plants and Humans Affairs, that Schultes went on to teach himself. Ames announced that each student would have to do a term paper, and they would have to do it based on a book at the back of the classroom. Schultes later told me, as the only work-study kid in the class, I had less free time than the other students, so as soon as class was over, I raced to the back and pulled the smallest book off the shelf. And that book was called Mescal, the Divine Plant and its psychological effects by Heinrich Kluver. Essentially, it was an account of peyote. Schultes brought the book home to East Boston, read it that night, and he said, decades later, I can still recall the dazzling accounts of the visions induced by the peyote cactus, and I vowed that one day I would try it myself. Well, he turned in such an impressive paper that Ames reached deep down into his pockets and financed an expedition to Oklahoma to visit the Kiowa peoples, some of the last of the Plains tribes living a traditional lifestyle in teepees, so that Schultes could experience peyote in its ritual settings. Now, Schultes had never been west of the Hudson, so this really was uh, Indian country, uh, as he referred to it. And he made the trek in an old Studebaker across country with a graduate student named Weston Labar, who became famous in his own right. He wrote a classic paper called Shamanic Origins of Religion and Medicine, did Labar, and I hardly recommend it. Anyhow, they spent a night in the teepee, taking peyote in a ritual setting, led by what the Kiowa call a roadman, essentially a shaman. And in 1936, Schultes came out of that teepee a changed person. Clearly, the peyote talked to him. Clearly, he realized that he was not going to medical school, that he would be on the healing path, but it would be a, a different path than other Western scientists interested in a profession which involved bringing medicine to the masses. Schultes finished his degree at Harvard with honors and then applied to study further with Ames, entered a PhD program, and for his thesis, he went down to Oaxaca. At the time, there were accounts of hallucinogenic mushrooms. Now, at the time, nobody believed there were hallucinogenic mushrooms. There was Amanita muscaria that we'll talk about in another episode from Siberia. But other than that, there were no known hallucinogenic mushrooms in the New World, in Mexico, in Central America, in the Amazon and a Smithsonian scientist named William Safford said that, no, there were no hallucinogenic mushrooms, it was just peyote, it was the Indians trying to mislead the missionaries. But Schultes was a better botanist than Safford, and he knew there would be no peyote, which thrives in desert-like conditions. There would be no pipe peyote in the tropical forests of Oaxaca and southern Mexico, and he set out to prove Safford wrong. So here's how Schultes described taking peyote with the Kiowa. It began with a period of contentment and oversensitivity and a period of nervous calm and muscular sluggishness. Then came the colored visual hallucinations 
an abnormal synesthesia, the mingling of the senses, alterations in tactile sensation, very slight muscular incoordination, disturbances in space and time perception, and auditory hallucinations may accompany severe peyote intoxication. The most striking characteristic, however, is the occasionally induced peyote visions, which are often fantastically colored. And there's two things that are particularly noteworthy about this count. One is the striking visions, which he discovered by reading about them. And unlike most people, he never he pursued it and he experienced it himself. The other is the idea of synesthesia, and this is characteristic of many of these entheogens, the mingling of senses, where you can see music and taste colors. To purchase Dr. Mark Plotkin's new book, The Amazon, What Everyone Needs to Know, or his first book, Tales of a Shaman's Apprentice, visit your local bookseller or order from Amazon.com. Schulte's brought the magic mushrooms back to Harvard. They were later analyzed by Albert Hoffman. Albert Hoffman, of course, is the fellow who synthesized LSD in 1938 and did it in part on compounds uh, extracted from these magic mushrooms. But there's another aspect to the story which is not very well known, and that is that Hoffman also synthesized the first beta blockers. I think the very first one is called Viscan. This is a multi-billion dollar class of drugs, and Hoffman did it in part inspired by the compounds he extracted from these magic mushrooms. So when we talk about plants of the gods or fungi of the gods, we're not just talking about compounds which may be useful for treating mental or emotional ailments. We're talking about compounds which have revolutionized uh, Western medicine and Western culture. As discussed in the episode on ergot, these compounds may have played a vital role in the beginnings of Western religions, in addition to many of the Aboriginal ones as well. Now, when you visited Schulte's in his lair, in his office at the Botanical Museum, you couldn't help but notice two pictures over his shoulders, behind him on the wall of his office. Schulte's was a great photographer. If you haven't seen his photographs, I strongly encourage you to pick up a book called Plants of the Gods. I think he was as great a photographer as Ansel Adams, and he was taking those pictures in much more challenging circumstances. Over his shoulder, to the left, was a picture of two Yukuna boys snuffing a tobacco snuff during the sacred Kayari dance to keep away the forces of darkness, on the right was Chiribiquete. Chiribiquete is, thanks primarily to Schultes, his indigenous colleagues in the Colombian government, with some assistance from the Amazon conservation team, is the largest rainforest protected area in the whole Amazon basin. The reason this is important is that Schultes was showing the importance of culture and the importance of nature. This led to the creation of an entire field known as biocultural conservation. It's not about protecting indigenous cultures or just about protecting healing plants. It's the combination of the two, which is the most holistic, the most shamanic, and the most effective. Schultes did his training at the Botanical Museum. The Botanical Museum is actually part of a complex. It is the Peabody Museum, which is anthropology, the Mineralogical Museum, which is geology, the Botanical Museum, and the Zoology Museum. Now these are all grouped together and known as the Harvard Museums of Natural History. But the museum got its start under the leadership of Louis Agassiz. Louis Agassiz was a very famous Swiss biologist. He came to Boston to give some lectures, and they were so well received that he was offered a job at Harvard, and he worked with Harvard and some of their donors to create the Museum of Comparative Zoology. At the time, this was one of, if not the finest naturalist museums in the world, certainly in North America. Now, Agassiz, in 1865, decided to launch an expedition to the Amazon. This became the biggest natural history expedition in the Amazon in the 19th century. And he was accompanied by several museum people and several of his students, the most famous of which was William James. William James is known today as the father of American psychology. 
but I believe that it was James' experience in the Amazon with Louis Agassiz that led to his understanding of the human mind. Keep in mind that William James was a rich Bostonian white kid who hung out with other rich white kids whose idea of cultural diversity was going to Europe and hanging out with rich white kids. In the Amazon, he was living and working and collecting with indigenous peoples, with Afro-Brazilians, with Brazilian military, with Portuguese royalty. And I believe that this is what led James to understand that we are all one and learn to understand different aspects of the human mind. A part of the Amazon story, a part of the history of psychology, underreported in the technical literature. And I recommend a classic paper called The Biology of Consciousness, written by my pal Brian Farrell, who is the number two director at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. It's The Biology of Consciousness from William James to Richard Schultes. This is easily findable on my personal website, markplotkin.com. Schulte's most enduring work in terms of publications was the book Plants of the Gods, which in many ways was the inspiration for this podcast, and he co-authored it with Albert Hoffman, the creator of LSD, and their basic thesis was that these plants played a fundamental role in our history, our culture, and our religion, and that we're still not only understanding their role in the past, but we're charting a course for the future with the understanding of the power and the healing potential of these plants. From Central America, from Oaxaca, Schultes having graduated with a PhD from Harvard, went to the Amazon in 1941, and he was in search of arrow poisons, which were then becoming important in Western medicine. Arrow poisons are the embodiment of Paracelsus' dictum that the dose makes the poison. In other words, A poison in one dose is a medicine in a smaller dose, and vice versa. Schultes got to Colombia, started poking about, doing some collecting. On his first day in Bogota, he took the subway to the end of the line and started looking at plants in the rainforest there, growing in some hills at the end of the line, and saw an orchid that he'd never seen before. Now, Schultes was, at the time, an expert on orchids, And he saw this tiny orchid, which he thought must be new to science, but he didn't have his plant press. So the only way he could preserve it was to take out his passport, gently press this little tiny orchid between the pages of this passport, brought it back and found that it was indeed a species new to science. I think you'll agree this is a very auspicious beginning to his long career with Colombia and the Colombian Amazon. Shortly thereafter, Pearl Harbor was bombed, and Schultes, as a patriotic American, went back to Bogota and reported for duty at the American embassy and said, I'm here to enlist. The ambassador said, forget about that. We have other plans for you. The Japanese have overrun the rubber plantations in Southeast Asia. The rubber is native to the Amazon, but it grows in plantation where there's no natural pests in Southeast Asia. It was planted there by the British. Rubber is fundamental to any war effort. Back then, even today, natural rubber. It cannot be replaced by synthetic rubber. So they said, instead of going off to fight in Europe or the Pacific, go back to the Amazon, find out how much rubber there is, figure out how to cut it to supply rubber for the war effort. The American mainstay of the infantry was the Sherman tank. A Sherman tank could take uh, up to a ton of rubber, between wires and brakes and all that other stuff. So it was a bit like throw me in the briar patch because they sent Schultes back to the Amazon to study the forest, work with the indigenous peoples, and collect rubber. One of the first tribes he worked with were the Kofan, who were master curare makers. He was able to collect many different forms of curare. In fact, in later years, Schultes sent a student, a graduate student, to continue studying with the Kofans, and he actually found a curare, an arrow poison made from a nutmeg, I mean a cinnamon tree. This is totally unreported prior to Pinkley's groundbreaking work. Another important finding amongst the Kofan, which was made by Schultes himself, was that of Yoko. Yoko is a forest liana, 
Now, I've taken this with the Kofan. They collect the liana in the forest. They scrape the bark into cold water. You drink it first thing in the morning. It's such a powerful stimulant that your fingertips tingle, and you don't get hungry or thirsty all day. The Kofan insist that if you take Yoko, you don't get malaria either. Remember that the first and most effective malaria drug ever discovered is quinine, which comes just west of there from the Andes. So this is something whose research uh, needs to be followed up. I'm very proud of the fact that the Amazon conservation team, my organization, partnered with the Kofan people about 10 years to set up the Orito Andes Medicinal Plant Sanctuary, an entirely new category of protected area, established at the behest of the indigenous peoples themselves in partnership with the Colombian government to protect yoko and other medicinal plants. Schulte's most important finding in terms of biodiversity was the landscapes of Chiribiquete. Chiribiquete was an extraordinary region right in the middle of the Colombian Amazon. You have to keep in mind the Colombian Amazon, we Americans tend to think of the Amazon as basically Brazil with a couple of you know, suburbs and these other eight countries. But the Colombian Amazon is bigger than New England. It's a huge space. And right in the middle of the Colombian Amazon is a region known as Chiribiquete. It is a region full of unexplored and unclimbed mountains. It is a region home to, we think, three uncontacted tribes. It is a region which is the richest repository of pre-Columbian paintings. Uh, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these paintings uh, which have been very poorly documented to date. And Schultes went there and was bewitched. And he kept a picture of Chiribiquete over his desk his entire time at Harvard. Interestingly enough, Schultes was not the discoverer of Chiribiquete. And of course, as an ethnobotanist, we always have to point out that we don't discover anything the indigenous peoples got there first. But when I say Schultes was the discoverer of ayahuasca, I mean that the indigenous peoples showed it to him and gave it to him and led the ceremony with him. When I say that Schultes discovered Chiribiquete from a Western perspective, uh, further research has revealed that it was another Harvard fellow who got there first an extraordinary character named Alexander Hamilton Rice. Alexander Hamilton Rice was a patrician. He was one of Boston's first families, born into wealth. He went to Harvard College. An extraordinary character. He, at one point, he was a professional boxer. He loved one thing more than anything, and that was travel. He decided to recreate the journeys of the voyageurs, uh, in eastern Canada and made an incredible trek overland, uh, paddling and dragging his canoe. And that is where his wanderlust was born. He went back to Harvard, finished his undergraduate degree, and entered medical school. However, once again, nature called. And his first great expedition was to recreate the trip of Oriana, which I think was 1521. It was the first European crossing of the Amazon. He landed at, at, in coastal Ecuador, crossed the Andes, uh, and sailed all the way down the Amazon. His second trip to South America was to recreate Bolivar's famous trek from Caracas to, to Bogota overland. And he was accompanied by a fellow who wanted to learn how to be a South American explorer. And his name was Hiram Bingham. Bingham later went on to discover Machu Picchu and became much more famous than Alexander Hamilton Rice ever was. But I don't think he ever would have got there if he hadn't been trained in the field by Rice himself. Rice made the first map of Chiribiquete in 1907, went back to Harvard, and created the Harvard Geographic Institute, and married Mrs. Widener, one of the wealthiest women in the world, who built Widener Library in Harvard Yard, named it after her son who drowned on the Titanic. And her money turbocharged his career because he realized that if you wanted to map the Amazon, it's easiest to do it from the air and began using her wealth to custom build planes and map the Amazon from the air. That was the first mapping of Chiribiquete and ironically preceded Schulte's explorations and exploit by several decades. <laughs> 
The next formative experience Schultes had in the Amazon was the Baile de Muñeco. This is the dance of the dolls, the dance of the spirits, where the Yukuna peoples dance for three days to propitiate forest spirits and to give thanks to nature for the bounty, particularly of the rivers, the forest fish. When I asked Schultes the details of the dance, and he said, it's three days, I thought, okay, that's like nine to five, nine to five, nine to five. He said, no, three days without stopping. When I asked him how they dance for three days without stopping, he said, each dance honors a particular spirit or particular animal, and then at the end of that dance, which can be 20 minutes to an hour more or less, they stop, take off their masks, and snort tobacco and chew coca. Now, Schulte's most extraordinary ethnobotanical find in the Amazon took place in the Sibandoy Valley in 1942. The Sibandoy Valley is the headwaters of the Putumayo. There are four great rivers in the Colombian Amazon, the Putumayo, the Caquete, the Caqueta, the Apaporas, and the Valpez. The headwaters of the Putumayo, or the Sibandoy Valley, which is known as the Valley of the Hallucinogens. For that is where Schultes met a shaman of the Kamsa tribe called Salvador Chindoy. And Schultes took ayahuasca in a ritual setting with Salvador Chindoy. Now, Schultes was famous for saying and for writing he never felt anything from ayahuasca, a couple of flashes of color. If you read the Yahe papers, which I'm not a great fan of, but it has a, a huge following. This is William Burroughs' account. Schulte says to Burroughs, who is a Harvard classmate, sorry, Bill, I just saw some flashes of color. No big deal. So ethnobotanists always worried how this father of ethnobotany, this so-called discoverer, scientific discoverer of ayahuasca, never felt the effects. And about 10 years ago, I was in Bogota, and I was visiting uh, Jesus Hidrobo. Schulte passed away, I think, in the year 2000. I was visiting Jesus Hidrobo, one of Schulte's old botanical colleagues, and I said, why did Schulte never feel the effects of ayahuasca? And he smiled and said, he did, and I can prove it. He looked me in the eye and said, one week ago, right on that chair you're sitting was Pedro Wahibioy. Now, Pedro Wahibioy was Schulte's guide in the Sibandoy. And his uncle was Salvador Chindoy. And I asked Pedro this exact same question. How come Ricardo never felt the effects of ayahuasca? And he said, Pedro replied, I was there the night my uncle Salvador gave Ricardo ayahuasca for the first time. And I watched as Schultes sat in the hammock and laughed and sang and told stories the entire time. And Hidrobo said, what did he say? What did he say? And Pedro shook his head and said, I don't know. It was all in English. Schulte's legacy lives on in many ways. First and foremost, his respect for indigenous colleagues. Time and time again, I talked to elderly indigenous healers who said, Schulte's was the first white man who came to us wanting to learn from us. Schultes danced our dances. Schultes took our peyote. Schultes chewed our coca. Schultes took our ayahuasca. Schultes took our snuff. This was unheard of at the time. The only outsiders we saw for the most part were missionaries who told us that all of those things were bad and we should stop doing it. Schultes was quite the opposite. Instead of telling us what to do, he wanted to learn from us. Secondly, Schulte's legacy is that nature is the ultimate medicine chest. There are medicines to be learned from nature which can heal our ills. Even ills which physicians cannot cure can sometimes be treated and sometimes be cured by indigenous shamans, whether it's with peyote, whether it's with mushrooms, whether it's with ayahuasca, or whether it's just by chanting. To the shaman, the hallucinogen, the entheogen, is a vegetal or fungal or biological scalpel which allows him or her to analyze, to diagnose, to treat, and sometimes to cure the human mind in ways that our own physicians cannot. Schulte's other lesson 
to academics in particular, and Westerners dealing with other cultures, is humility. That these people are different than us. That these people may not have had the advantages we have. But oft times, particularly in the rainforest, these people know far more than we do. So in that sense, in an age where the outside world is discovering the value and the potential of the plants of the gods. Richard Evan Schultes got there before we did, and the indigenous peoples got there before he did. This has been Plants of the Gods, Healing, Culture, and Conservation with Dr. Mark Plotkin. Stay tuned for more stories about shamans, hallucinogens, entheogens, unique religious and cultural histories, and rainforest adventures and cures. If you enjoyed this episode, please recommend us to your friends and rate and review on iTunes. If you have any questions about today's episode, direct message us on our Twitter or Instagram at Doc Mark Plotkin or Facebook Plants of the Gods Pod, and the questions will be answered by me. Follow our Facebook page for more information, or check the Amazon Conservation Team webpage, www.amazonteam.org, for more information on our field programs. Excited to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in.